So good evening again, <laughs> and thank you for coming for what was going to be a really special night. We're delighted to have Rick Russo come back to Carbondale. Um, he, of course, is one of the country's leading novelists, one of the most respected and popular writers. Uh, was also a teacher at SIU for five or six years, uh, left a, a strong impression on the university, and was really gracious to, to come and, and visit with us. For tonight's format, I'm just going to introduce him very briefly. He obviously doesn't need a great uh, lengthy introduction. And then he and I are going to converse for about 35 minutes about his writing and his career. And then we are going to open it up for questions. I look forward to good questions from all of you. And then he will sign some books um, in the back after the program. I will kind of usher them back pretty quickly uh, because a lot of books have been sold already. So <laughs> we feel very good about that. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about Rick. I mean, you know quite a bit, but he was born or grew up in a, in a town called Gloversville, New York, a community which uh, shapes a lot of his writing. He attended the University of Arizona, where he met his wife, Barb. Barb, welcome. For, great to have you here as yeah. well. <laughs> Barb has been tooling around Carbondale today, so you may have seen her at various places. So. Um, but they met at the University of Arizona. Uh, Rick studied uh, uh, American literature, earned a, a PhD, and then he switched over and went and got an MFA in creative writing. Um, he has uh, he taught at SIU as I mentioned from 1986 to 1991. Uh, was a terrific, uh, terrific uh, um, teacher. Uh, he was also writing when he was here. While he was here, his first book was published, Mohawk. And another book was written um, when he was here as well, Wrist Pool. There have been a lot of reports that uh, Rick did some of his best writing at, on Denny's, at Denny's <laughs> on Route 13. So we're going to have to hear a little bit more about that. I saw one of his colleagues described him as a cafe writer. And I'm not sure Denny's qualifies as a <laughs> cafe, but, but we'll, we'll round it up. So, but no, I mean, Rick has obviously had this amazing career. I, you know, Nobody's Fool came out in 1993, became a movie with Paul Newman. He won a Pulitzer Prize in 2002 and has finished his trilogy uh, just this past year, Somebody's Fool. And, um, and it also has been very involved in the, um, the, the series Lucky Hank, which he had writ wrote the book, the inspiring book, uh, Straight Man. I was uh, reading uh, some reviews, and the Washington, uh, a review in the Washington Post described him as, quote, our national priest of masculine despair and redemption. <laughs> On a more lofty note, he was introduced at Politics and Prose as a statesman of American letters. So we'll focus on the statesmanship uh, <laughs> today. So let me just uh, begin our conversation, and again, we'll talk for about 35, 40 minutes, and then open it up to you. So thanks so much. Well, Rick, I mean, if you want to say an opening word or two, I mean, you've been in town for a day and a half. Uh, you've been terrific with students. You met with uh, the English faculty. We gave them a tour on the golf cart of the campus, a walking tour. Yeah. Uh, any, anything you might want to say just to open it up? Well, um, the obvious thing to say is thank you. Um, thank you for, for all of this. I've been treated so royally, so wonderfully since returning. Um, but, um, more, more importantly, even than that, um, is the fact that when I came to SIU and my first novel, uh, was not out yet. It came out, I think, while I was here. Um, um, when I came here, this was my first job, I think, where anybody thought of me as a writer, despite the fact that the book wasn't out yet. I was hired here as a writer. Uh, with with my great friend Rodney Rodney Jones, whose own first book of poetry was coming out, um, and and during that time that we were here, we were treated we were treated like grown ups, and um, and I, I think that was our first both of our first experience of that. We were we were encouraged to create a um, 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 a creative writing MA, uh, and and later of course. Uh, an MFA came into being here, but during during those years that I was that I was in Carbondale, um, I became a better writer because I wasn't for the first time in my life I was not teaching eight courses a year, seven of them freshman compositions. I didn't go home 
Um, I didn't go home every night with a, with a stack of papers to grade. Um, and um, so I had time to do the work that was so important to me. A lot of the groundwork for, for my later novels was based on the work that I did here. And, um, and as I was meeting with so many students here today, especially those in the MFA program, one of the things that I realized, too, is that not only did I become a better writer here, I became a better teacher here. Because when you don't have, when you don't have that many freshman compositions to grade every night, you can devote more time to the kinds of, to the kinds of students that you really want to give more time to here. And so I owe, I owe an awful lot to this institution um, for giving me the time to be a better writer. But also, um, I think just as importantly, I learned to be a better teacher here. And, uh, and that has proven to be valuable as well. Great. Well, I want to go back and sort of understand how your, your development unfolded. And I, I want to read a couple sentences from an essay you wrote. Um, you, and, and this is how you write it. You said, I have to say, I'm not aware of anyone teacher, family member, friend, who predicted anything like the great good fortune that has befallen me in the writing career that I came to fairly late. Some years ago, I ran into an old girlfriend who said she had been following me at work with both pleasure and mystification. <laughs> Quote, I always thought you were a nice enough guy, she told me, clearly trying to puzzle it through and not wanting to hurt my feelings but I never dreamed you had any books in you. Yeah. <laughs> to which you responded, I know exactly how she felt. I can't explain it even now. <laughs> but let's go back to the beginning. I mean, you grew up in this town in upstate New York, and it's, it's an important part of, um, of your writing. I mean, tell us about that community and how it maybe sense, shaped your sense of community, uh, the kind of the cruelties of the global economy, how people operate. Talk about Gloversville. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to, um, if you've read my work, you already know a lot about it because most of those, most of those fictional towns that I've written about are, um, whether it's Mohawk or, or, um, um, later on any of my, any of my fictional towns, even, even when I, even when I leave upstate New York and write about such exotic locations as Maine, where I live now, even Empire Falls was just full of, was just full of Gloversville. And one of the reasons for that is that I met a lot of the same kind of hardworking um, people in Maine that I had known from upstate New York. And really the only reason I set that book in Maine, looking back on it now, I didn't think of it as a particularly Maine book, but one of the characters in it, Max Roby, um, uh, Miles', Miles um, um, father, um, he needed, one of the things I needed for him to do was to be on the coast um, so that so that he could um, he was a painter uh, and not a very good one a house painter and I had him I had him making a lot of of money on the coast painting rich people's windows shut um, and as you know upstate New York doesn't have any coasts uh, and so and I had recently I had recently moved to Maine and I thought well we'll just we'll just shift this this here so even even my work. This seems farthest away from Gloversville. Gloversville is never very far. Um, the farthest geographically and in terms of, um, you know, a, a completely different kind of location, I set one of my novels on Martha's Vineyard, where uh, Barbara and I visit. We've never been able to afford to live there, but, but, we, but we do visit in September when all the bros go home and the prices come down. Um, but even that novel is, is set through the eyes of um, three scholarship kids um, who just happened to have gone to this college on the coast of Connecticut, and they just happened to have been there for two long weekends in their, in their, entire, in, in their entire adult lives. They've gone to this island twice, once when they're very young men just graduated from a small liberal arts college and one and one when they're 66 years old. And so that island, so that island, even when I'm farthest from Gloversville, it's still, everything still filters through the eyes of people like that. Um, and um, I'll say one more thing about it. Um, the, the street, the neighborhood, 
that I grew up on, I grew up in, in Gloversville, um, was full of people who probably had never owned homes before. And, and Gloversville was, was not a rich town by any means. Most of the people there worked in the glove shops or the tanneries were not overpaid for that work, believe me. Times were tough uh, and times had always been tough there. Um, the most recent immigrants were the people who lived downtown closest to the factories, closest to the, um, to the tanneries. Um, and and, and, and the, the first wave of immigrants tended to be a little bit farther up the slope and a little bit less dangerous territory. And in, and in my particular neighborhood, um, a lot of the people who lived there were really taking a risk in owning a home, even a very, very modest home. This was such a risk, for, such a risky thing for them to do because the jobs that they did in many cases were pretty dangerous. And, and so what if you, you know, so what if you take, you go out on a limb and you buy this really modest, maybe two family home in a neighborhood of immigrants of all different sorts of, I mean, there were Poles there and Croats there and Irish and Italian. And, and, um, um, and so you go there and you, and you spend what seems like a very insignificant amount of money, but you're also aware that when you own a house, it kind of owns you. And for a lot of, and for a lot of these, um, a lot of these men, it was the first time they'd ever invested that way. They weren't sure that home ownership in America was really for people like them. And what happened if they got hurt on the job, right? If you get hurt on, if you get hurt on the job or you become ill on the job, as a lot of these guys did, you lose your house. And if you do that, it's even worse than never having a house to begin with because not, I mean, it's much worse to, to have something and then, and then to lose it. But, but as I say now, these were, these were Irish, Italian, Polish, and, and these were people these were people who decided to buy in this neighborhood rather than living in the neighborhood, another neighborhood that would have been full of people like them, except they'd all be Irish, they'd all be Italian, they'd all be Polish, they'd all be whatever. These were people who, who, um, who believed in an America of, of assimilation. That's how, they, that's how they saw themselves, first and foremost. Um, as Americans, they were very patriotic in, in, in that respect. But that was the kind of mindset that they had. Um, um, and, and I went there um, recently on book tour. Um, I did an event in Saratoga Springs, which is, of course, the, the, uh, the town that I modeled my, my Schuyler Springs on in, in my Three Fool novels. And I went there that night, the, uh, the night before we'd been in Saratoga Springs, and I went into Gloversville the next day and visited um, my cousin, my cousin Greg and his wife Carol, who I hadn't seen in a while, they couldn't come to Saratoga the night before. And we drove into my old neighborhood. Um, owned, all the houses were owned by men like my grandfather, and they were meticulously cared for. My God, you know the the tiny terraces. The houses were built really close together. They had tiny little postage stamp um, um, uh, terraces. But these men painted their house every other year. They climbed those, they climbed those those ladders, and they scraped and they painted, and they took meticulous care of these of these houses that scared them. Um, but but my God, I mean, there was you could you could tell the rich people didn't live there, but they treated they treated these houses with such love and respect. Um, and I went to my old neighborhood. We pulled in, and I simply could not believe what I was seeing. It was the kind of oof, economic devastation that you read about all the time in places that are off the beaten path in America, places that have been left behind. And I just, I just felt the betrayal that, that people like my grandfather, long gone now, would have, would have felt if they had looked at that community and seen every other house boarded up. Um, every other, you'd, you'd see porches just pulled away from, from, from uh, these dwellings so that, um, I mean, the, the, the front door is no longer accessible from the street. You know, you, you could see the, the underpinnings of these houses right down into the city. You'd, you'd have to go up a side entrance. And to see that kind of, to see that kind of economic um, devastation wrought 
Um, on, on my old neighborhood, there were other neighborhoods in Gloversville that would not have surprised me to see that. But I felt absolutely gutted by what I saw there. And um, even now, as you can tell, talking about it, um, even, even now, I just, I just sensed my, my family's and my grandfather's betrayal of what they felt America was going to be like, like after the Second World War when, because of the GI Bill, et cetera, people like that could own homes for the first time. It was absolutely astonishing. Um, uh, still processing, still processing it. As a matter of fact, so that's the Glovers. That's the Gloversville that that I come from, and it's and it's and it's also um, you know it's also Mohawk, and it's also Empire Falls, and it's also uh, North Bath. All the places that I've that, I've that that I've written about for all these years in these books. That's 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 what inspired all of those places. Well, you also talk about the importance of the local library there. Yeah. And at one point you write, um, it was from my mother that I learned that reading was not a duty but a reward. You can't make a writer without first making a reader, and that's what my mother made me. Yeah. Talk about the importance of reading and, and launching your career. My mother worked at GE in Schenectady, uh, New York, um, and which was a good hour away. I don't think the throughway was even completely built yet at the time when she started working there. So it was, a, it was a good hour away. And um, we lived, my mother and I, my, my, my grandfather bought that house when it became clear that my parents weren't going to make it <laughs> and that she and I would need someplace to live. So we lived upstairs um, in a flat that was identical to theirs downstairs. Most mornings by the time I woke up, my mother was already, already in a car um, with, a, with a bunch of people who worked at GE heading, heading to Schenectady. Um, and she worked her her eight hours there with an hour on one side um, before I got up. And then when she got back, I would have already eaten dinner with my grandparents and she would have to cook herself something for dinner. Um, and then after that, after putting in that long now eight or nine hour day, she would have to do all the things for me that I would need for school the next day, maybe iron a, sh iron a shirt, a uniform shirt or something like that. Um, and by the time she was done with all of that, it was probably 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And what any person you would expect to do at that point is just sit down in the chair, turn on the TV, um, and, and, and try to put that long day behind you with something that didn't require, you know, reading is work, as we, all, as we all know. It's not as passive as sitting in front of a TV or watching a movie or listening to music, all things that we love to do and should do. But they require, they're not entirely passive, you know, um, pursuits. And my mother would, um, um, every night, um, pick up a book and read it. And it was from, from her that I understood that this is what you do to reward yourself, you know, for a, for a, for a hard, difficult day. Um, and, and I don't think she ever said a word to me that I should become a reader, ever. That this is that this is something you should do. This should be part of it. But she didn't have to, you know. I just I just saw the way she behaved, and and she made by the time by the time I was finished with high school, I I think I had read almost all of her books plus the books. Well, I didn't actually I didn't read that many of the books that were assigned to me in high school, <laughs> but I, I I pretended to. Um, but but I was I had become by that point a voracious reader, and. As I continue to tell students today, when they, and I think now it's different too, John, because if you want to be a writer now, as opposed to when I was a when I was a boy becoming a man, when I was in graduate school, if you wanted to be a writer, it was probably um, because you were a reader, and that's how your stories came to you. An awful lot of students today want to become writers not because they're voracious readers, but because they're writer, because stories come to them now from, not just from movies and TV shows, but video games. They're all, they're all, they're all sorts of, of entertainments out there now that didn't exist when I was a boy or a young man that, that cause students now to want, to want to become writers because stories, stories of course are everywhere. Um, and through many more mediums now, and one of the first things that you have to do 
uh, of people who come up to you and say that they want to be writers is say, all right, what are your, what is, what is, where does this, this urge, this storytelling urge, where does it come from? Because it, it, it affects how you, um, how you, how you approach their work and, and whatever dreams they may have. Um, because it's not as clear cut anymore, but the people who want to be writers, they want to become writers for a lot of very different and sometimes <laughs> troubling reasons. <laughs> well, it, let's touch briefly on your academic career because you had, you got a, a doctorate in American literature. Mm -hmm. And then as you were finishing it up, you walked across the hall and started an MFA program. And those are sort of two, uh, on other sides of the Berlin Wall, they seem like they're two communities. Yeah, yeah, that don't... yeah. yeah. So there is a checkpoint, Charlie, in between them. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So talk about how you know what what prompted you to to say thank you very much. I love this PhD, but I want to I want to I want to go in a different direction. Um, I think I think most of it was because as a graduate student, English departments um, then as now, and probably even more so now. But the English department that I was part of at the University of Arizona uh, in the 70s and 80s, because I was there during, this was during Vietnam, you just stayed as long as you could. <laughs> uh, um, so it housed American literature, English literature, folklore, English as a second language, creative writing, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm leaving out two or three other disciplines um, that, that would have that would have been, in, that would have been involved there when I was a graduate student. And um, the office that I was in for many of those years as a teaching assistant, because I was, I was teaching even as I was uh, doing my own classwork, um, contained students from all of those disciplines. By that time, I was already, I was already probably well into my, my PhD at that point. And I was already finished reading books I was now reading books about books. So instead of reading, <laughs> instead of reading Jane Austen, I was now reading biographies of Jane Austen, <coughs> Austen um, critical works about Jane Austen, etc. Whereas the creative writing students, on the other hand, after finishing their long uh, three-hour seminars where their stories were being dissected and put back together again and everything, they would disappear to the local bar. Um, and and talk about literature, which is what I had always hoped to do. And they were still doing it as creative writing students were, whereas all the scholars were going home, you know, and they were and they were reading scholarship. They were being scholars. Um, so at, at some so at some point, realizing that that if I wanted to be stay interested in literature, um, and if I wanted to have that that. That that's that wonderful sense of discovery about about books. I was just much better off in creative writing, and I went across and I knocked on on the door of the director of creative writing, who became a kind of mentor to me. And I said, I think I might want to be a writer. He said, Well, show me something that you've written. I said, I haven't written anything. <laughs> and um, and he said, Well, write something. And and I I said, I can just do that without a prompt or anything. And he said, No, go on and write something. So I went home and I wrote a story and I brought it back and I gave, and gave it to him and I said, and, and he said, well, you might need some lessons. <laughs> and uh, it turned out a lot of lessons and I kept so I, went, I went over there and, and knocked on the door and I kept turning in stories and they were, and, and, and they were, and they were bad. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, Bob, Bob Downs, who's, who's doing this said, well, let's put you in some actual classes rather than you just. Um, and I thought, okay, that sounds that sounds good. I can't wait to get into a, I can't wait to get into a workshop um, and have others other students um, um, critique my work. Um, and I thought what he was going to do was put me in the graduate student MFA creative writing workshop. He put me in the undergraduate beginning. <laughs> It was like it was after introductory after introduction to creative writing. You would then go into an intermediate, which was a workshop. And so I spent I spent um, um, two semesters with uh, with undergraduates in the undergraduate workshop before I was finally good enough to get in to the to the graduate to the graduate student workshop. Um, 
and that was that was just how much work I how much work I had to do, uh, how much work I had to make up in order to in order to do that the kind of work I needed to do to be in. But yeah, to be sent back to the to the sophomore level, <laughs> sophomore level undergraduate uh, uh, course was was um, um, mildly eviscerating, shall we say? <laughs> <laughs> Rick, I want to read a couple sentences that you've written about uh, the the art of writing novels or the challenge. You say novel writing is mostly triage, this now, that later, feeling your way around in the dark, trying to anticipate laws of unintended consequences living with and welcoming uncertainty, trying something, and when that doesn't work, trying something else, welcoming clutter, surrendering a good idea for a better one, knowing you won't find the finish line for a year or two or five, or maybe never, without caring too much, putting one foot in front of the other, taking small bites, chewing thoroughly, grinding it out, knowing that when you finally settled something, Knowing that when you've finally settled everything, that too can be uh, lead to chaos, rinse and repeat. Yeah, yeah. So I, mean, I know, like when you're talking to students, uh, <laughs> I mean, they were saying, "Tell us about the writing process." And the point you made is, I mean, is just the importance of just sheer persistence and doggedness. Yeah, and and for novelists, I think in in particular, um, novelists are, are peculiar people in an, any number of ways, but they're particularly uh, peculiar in the sense that they can live with anxiety for uh, for a very long time. To be able to um, to say to yourself, "I'm going to work on something that's probably going to," at least in my case, because I write fairly big books, and I and I. I suspected early on, and what I know now is that most of my books are going to be five, six, seven, eight hundred pages in manuscript. Um, and when you ask yourself how many people in any particular, no matter what you do, whether you're in the arts or in something else, um, how many people are willing to spend four, five, maybe six years without any sense of whether that is going to pay off in some way? How many people can afford? Uh, to spend that amount of time on something that may just not work out, and you may have little or or nothing to show for it. It takes a certain it takes a certain um, um, ability. I, I I don't think it's some of it is chutzpah. You think ah hell I can do it, uh, but 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 a short story. I mean I have enormous respect for short story writers, novella writers, all of all, whatever you can do in the arts, it's all hard. And I have enormous respect for anybody working in the arts because more than anything else, um, I mean, if you go to, if you go to law school or you go to med school, how many years is it before you get to put out a shingle that says you're a doctor or you're a lawyer and so um, you you may not get into the discipline that you want. You may, um, and it doesn't mean that once you once you become a doctor or a lawyer, you don't have other things. There, there there aren't other things that you still have to learn. Yet you are a professional in your field, and and if you stick it out and you finish law school or you finish med school, you are a doctor. You are a lawyer. Um, if you put that same amount of time into into the arts, you're someone at that point who still wants to be an artist. Um, you're not. You're not there yet. You have no shingle to put out. Um, but certain art forms, like the short story, for instance, I think you'll know whether you've got a short story in a matter of weeks or months. Um, and that doesn't make them easy to write. Um, there are a lot of failed short stories and a lot of failed short story writers out there, but at least you get the news. <laughs> you get the news promptly. Um, and, and what novelists, I think, have to, have to live with what the, the grind that you're talking about um, is, is that sense of can I really, really spend that amount of time for something that in the end just might not work. And you might then get to start something else that is just as problematic as, 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 the, as the thing that you failed at. It takes, it takes a certain 
personality, I think, to, uh, to become a, no a novelist, to live with that kind of doubt. And, and believe me, the little voice in your head throughout that entire five years is, is saying, you're not up to this, are you? You know? <laughs> well, let's, I mean, in kind of the later phase of your career, screenwriting has yeah. really taken off. And you've described it as almost another side of the brain. Talk about screenwriting and, and the skill it requires and the discipline it requires and just the different approach. Yeah, it, it, it is. It, it's um, it contains a lot of very different. Um, you you have a different toolbox, um, frankly. If you're if you're a screenwriter, um, a lot of novelists become screenwriters. So it's not entirely. It's not entirely. I think I think you're more likely to go that direction than the other direction. I I, I don't know many screenwriters who don't want to be novelists and who wouldn't love to, and who wouldn't love to be novelists at some point, um, because among other things your name goes on the novel, whereas the screenwriter, the, the, above, the above the title is all, all goes to directors and, 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 uh, uh, and actors and all of that. So you never, you never get your due as a screenwriter. Very seldom does your name go up in, in, in lights that way. And so many of them want to be novelists, a few, and a few do. Um, but novelists are much more likely to become um, screenwriters than than vice versa. I think I could be wrong about that, but that's I haven't done a survey. I don't I don't have data, but that's my sense of of this. Um, and um, as I say, it's a different skill set. When I'm working on a screenplay, one of the reasons that I took to screenplay writing and enjoy it so much is that it plays to is that it plays to my strengths. Um, I have a much better ear than I do an I. Um, and the beauty of screenwriting is that you don't spend an awful lot of time describing anything. You know, the, the slug line, as I was saying in a class earlier, the slug line says, exterior, farmhouse, day. <laughs> All right, you're done. <laughs> you're done, with, the phys you're done with, with, with seeing for a long time. And now in the center of the page is all of this dialogue of people talking to each other. Well, if you have a good ear, and that's, I don't have a good eye, but I do have a good ear, um, then you've just, you've just cut your job, you've just cut your job as a writer at least in half, and maybe, maybe two-thirds of the stuff that you would do in a novel, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about that anymore. So when I'm writing screenplays, I'm playing to my particular strengths, which are um, um, dialogue and action, putting, making people do things, making people say things, what what are they what are they thinking? What are your characters thinking? Well, I'm sure they're thinking a lot, but it better come out of what they say and do because there's no camera in here, right? Um, so, it 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 plays it plays to my strengths, and it's one of the reasons that I that I went to it. And when I when I when I run up against a wall uh, in a novel, the best thing for me to do is set it aside for a while. Um, and go write a screenplay or a pilot for a, a TV series uh, or something and let the back of my brain work on the novel. Um, and my toolbox is much smaller, and it's all, the, it's all the tools that I know how to do particularly well. But that said, when I finish working on a screenplay and I go back to the novel, I get to open that novelist toolbox and all those things that I haven't had access to for all those for all those months, I get to say, "Oh God, look at those crescent wrenches! I remember those, right? You know." And you get out your old toolbox, and and suddenly, suddenly, the things that were more difficult, yeah, they're more difficult, but they're also a wonderful challenge. And you remember what it felt like to use those tools that you've now just kind of given up for a while, and 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 you. They look like old friends, and and uh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to get back to them. As much as I love screenwriting, I'm a novelist. That's it's 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 what I am. I've carved out a lovely side hustle out of <laughs> uh, and and a lucrative at times a lucrative side hustle out of out of my screenwriting career. Um, but if somebody asks me who I am, if they ask me what I am. I am a novelist. Um, I just can't imagine another answer to that. 
Well, you're known for your comedy, and, and, and you've said in a number of interviews, you know, pay attention to the world, and you will see plenty that is amusing. But I want to read a couple sentences you wrote once uh, about comedy. You say, laughter is often a more complex and thoughtful emotional response than tears, though we seem to believe that being moved to tears is somehow more noble. Mirth remains our best hedge against sentimentality and self-importance, as well as a natural antidote to piety. That last especially, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's, so for you, it's not like, oh boy, I, I got to it's time to be funny here. It's yeah. just, talk a little bit about how comedy comes into your writing. Well, one of the things I get asked a lot, especially, uh, especially by students, um, uh, and those who recognize the value of comedy. Um, and, and very often I'll, I will be asked by um, uh, an MFA student or an undergraduate student, how do you make things funny? Um, and my answer to that is, I never make anything funny. Um, the, wor the, the world is a funny place. Um, what I'm doing when what what I'm doing when my characters are funny on the page is paying tribute to a certain kind of truth, a truth that is very often ignored by 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 people who um, who have simply a different mission. It's not a lesser mission than mine. Moving, I mean, I love being moved to tears as much as as much as anybody, um, um, but. If that's the only arrow in your quiver, uh, the only string in your bow, I would say you're missing about half of the world. And, um, I, and I particularly love that half of the, that half of the world um, for all of the reasons that, that, that you just read in, that, um, in that, um, those, those sentences of mine. But I do resist the notion that a comic writer makes the world funny. The comic writer, a comic writer is somebody who sees the humor in something and kind of stores it away. You see that twice. You maybe the serious stuff you see, but you, but maybe you see it once and you and you log it away and, or maybe you just think that's the thing that I'll remember. But you see the comedy twice and you store it in a special place. I think and so and so for me. Um, it's, it's particularly valuable that way, and I never have to make it. It's just there. All I have to do is, is really um, remember, it, is remember it, and it's particularly valuable to me and to the, to the kind of writer that I am, not because I want the world to, to be funny, or because I want you to be laughing your asses off all the time, although I'm happy if you do, um, the reason that comedy is so important to a writer like me is that I want to go to very dark places and I don't want you to follow me there to really dark places unless I can give you something else along the way. And um, the, 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 some, of the, some of the writers who have meant the most to me are writers who did that? I mean, what is The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn but one of the darkest novels ever written in America? It's about racism, it's about, it's about, yeah, it's about bigotry, it's about ignorance, it's about violence, it's about every part of the American character that we wish weren't true. It was true then, it's too often true now, and if we're going to, for a writer like me, who is interested in many of, in, and in justice, my God, uh, the injustice in Huckleberry Finn, if, if you want to go to those dark places as I do, and as I insist upon going, and I, I, there are many people who have told me that, num number, for instance, that the third of my fool novels is by far the darkest. There's no question in my mind that that's true. The third, the third novel goes to some dark places that I, I mean, pure evil doesn't even exist in Nobody's Fool. It rears its head in, in Everybody's Fool and becomes a presence in Somebody's Fool 
it's, it's, it's a very dark presence indeed. But that's also true um, in, in, my, in my other novels. And the reason, the, the reason it's there is, is exactly that, is because I want you to, I want, you to want to follow me there. And, and um, I, I just don't think you're going to if all I have for you is bad news and, um, and, a, and a chance to step back and, and look at all of us Look at all of us in our, not only in our best moments, but also in our worst moments, and 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 see the fool, see the fool in all of us, because <laughs> we're we, we've all been there, <laughs> uh, we've all we've all we've all been there, we've all done that incredibly dumb thing, and then looked around to see if anybody saw us do it, <laughs> right? Um, and that's our common humanity, um, I think, and it's the reason that it's so why humor is just so important to me. Good. I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to turn it over to you. Um, in, um, in your Fool series, one of the preeminent characters, of course, is Sully, who's yeah. modeled yeah. after your father, who yeah. fought yeah. at Utah Beach. Absolutely. You know? yeah. and, um, and in the movie, Paul Newman becomes um, Sully. And I was struck by one interview where you were saying, I guess you were on set, and Sully has an injury, so Newman was on set and he was limping yeah. in character. And then at one point he pulled you aside and said, what kind of music did he like? Yeah. And you're like, I hadn't really thought of that yeah, one. Yeah. I mean, talk, tell us about working with Paul Newman. Let's go there. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and Paul, I'm trying to think when he was, when he was filming Nobody's Fool, um, what, had he, Barb, had he turned 70 that year or was it 60? I can't remember. 70. He was filming... Um, he, he was um, Sully, I believe, at that point was sixty, but he was Paul Newman wasn't at seventy. Paul Newman was a good sixty. Uh, <laughs> but my first thought, my first thought was the first time I met him on the set of Nobody's Fool, um, he came he came up limping um, toward me, and I thought, oh my God, we're only we're only two weeks into this shoot, and he's already hurt himself. <laughs> but of course, he hadn't hurt himself. He was Sully, and and he was he was shooting that day, and. And Sully limped, and so did and so did Paul, and he limped through that um, through that empire, through that entire movie. I'm not sure he limped in his trailer necessarily, or or when or when he and Joanne were having dinner in a restaurant that night, or, or or anything like that. But he tried to stay in character as as much as possible, and I think he wanted to be in character, especially when he was meeting the author of the novel for the first time. And so, so here he came hobbled, hobbling up the, uh, up, up the street. And he did what other actors have done. Um, also, since then, I've, my path has crossed with, with several actors. Um, and they all want to know the stuff that I know about the character that wasn't in the novel. <laughs> What kind of music? What kind of music does does Sully listen to? And I'm I, I'm I'm always a source of enormous disappointment to actors, <laughs> because the truth is that I've already told I've already told them far more than I know. Uh, I've told them everything I know for sure, and the rest of it is just guessing. So when they come to me for extra value, there's almost nothing there to give them. I could make something up, but. But um, what kind of what kind of music did Sully listen to? I'm not sure he listened to music at all. It had, it had never it had never it had never occurred to me. Um, but Paul was absolutely determined that if there was anything else that I knew about this character, um, that I that I tell him about it. Um, but. I think the thing that was more interesting about, about Paul's performance in that movie was that as desperate as he was to know more, he already knew far more than enough. Mm. Um, I think that the great Paul Newman performances, as much as I loved the early stuff and as much as I loved the Paul Newman of of the the more pop is the most popular movies in his career in mid career were movies like The Sting and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid wonderful 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 movies um, 
that I, I, I just wrote an, I wrote an essay actually about uh, recently that it'll be in a new book of essays coming out about Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, um, um, which is strangely enough a movie about disruption, about horses being replaced by wheels, if you think about it. But, any, but anyway, um, um, what I loved about Paul Newman's performance in Nobody's Fool and in when he played Frank Galvin in, in the movie about the lawyer, um, Final Verdict, the, the verdict, the verdict. Um, and all of his late performances, I think, um, I, th I think at that time, by that time in his life, Paul had, had, um, he had, he had lived more, um, at that point he had lost a son. I think that at that point, all of those movies were about, were about, um, men that had second chances. And he was so good at that. Um, and so good, um, there's one scene, my favorite scene in, in Nobody's Fool is a scene um, in, in which Benton and I kept writing dialogue. And it was a scene with, with Sully and his son Peter in a truck and it's raining outside. And, and Benton and I had written all of this dialogue in which, in which Sully is trying to explain to his son why he wasn't there, why he walked away from his family. Um, and Paul kept saying, cut the dialogue, cut, cut most of this dialogue. And, and Benton and I would say, well, how is, how is he going to, if, if we don't explain it, how is, he, how, are, how, how, how is the audience going to know? No. And so we'd cut a line here and a line there and a line, another line, and we cut to, we cut a page and a half of dialogue down to a page, and then we cut it down to half a page. Um, and what he did was he cut it, in the end, he cut it all. And I'll just, I won't say anything more about it than that. He cut it all. He just said, have the camera close on my face on the other side of the windshield with the, with the, with the rain coming down. And what he did was he tried, he tried and failed to explain. That's what he did. You could see him just... He would give anything to explain to his son why he walked away. Um, but, it's the, but it was the failure to explain, his inability to find words that he was after. And here we were, we were just trying to give him words. We were trying to, we were trying to make it verbal, trying to give him, trying to, trying, to make it, trying to make it understandable to the viewer. And, 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 and he didn't need a single word. That's a good actor. <laughs> Great. Well, let's turn it over to you and get some questions. Uh, thank you. Rick, I want to quickly yep. say my favorite quote of yours, uh, one of my favorites is, this is a little off point, it says, whenever you have a Southern or Northern or Eastern or Western before an institution's name, you know it will be wildly underfunded. <laughs> SIU's lobbyists in Springfield will be brandished. That, uh, that, was, that was true in my experience. <laughs> okay, do you want to shout out? Or do we have a microphone in the audience somewhere? Or do you, if you want to shout out a question, I'll repeat it so everybody can hear. Or no, we have a microphone back there. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Hi. Uh oh, another the problem is now I've been given the good microphone. Does anybody have a question actually Mindy has a question? Yes. What is the difference between literature and fiction? Well, um, I, I had a chance to tell this story. Um, this is an SIU story, and I had a chance to tell it earlier today. And, but I would love, this is the kind of story I would love to tell twice. One of the, um, one, I think it was maybe my second year, 
um, here, we had um, a visiting writer, and we had um, a bunch of, of, of um, students throughout the humanities, because this was a humanities-wide um, event. Um, and so it was held in a very large room with a very large um, elongated table, and around the inside of the table were students from various courses in the humanities. On the outside of the table was a ring of faculty members who were there. They were told to be on the outside of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of the audience here to order to make sure that the students got to ask the questions first and they didn't, that faculty basically wouldn't dominate the, the discussion. Okay, well, the visiting writer was none other than Isaac Besheva Singer. And the first question that was asked is, what is literature? Uh, or what is the purpose of literature, I think, was, was what he was asked. And he said, very simply, the purpose of literature is to entertain and to instruct. And there was silence for a bit. Um, and one of the students, I don't know whether he had been coached or whatever, but whoever the student was said, well, doesn't literature also, and, and he held up a finger, waved, his, waved a finger and said, the purpose of literature <laughs> is to entertain and to instruct. And then somebody else said, but, and he, <laughs> no, the perp, and, and then he said, and, and also note that it's never in the other order, because you're never going to you're never going to instruct someone you haven't first entertained. Two purposes, no other. You entertain, and you and you instruct. And if you're very very lucky, maybe what you've done, if you've entertained properly, and your instruction um, and your instruction is spot on. Maybe 50 years from now, someone will consider what you have written to be literature, but we won't know probably for a good long while whether, whether it is literature, uh, whether if it is literature, then it stands a much better chance of lasting. Although we know even with literature, um, some of the best literature we know had to be rediscovered. Moby Dick disappeared. For the better part of for the better part of a hundred years, and, and had to be and had to be rediscovered, but I, but one of the things I loved about that was that he was absolutely um, insistent upon upon that that it was very simple. Don't make it more complicated than it is. Um, to entertain first, um, and and then once you're entertaining, to slip in if possible. Something that is a lesson, something that makes us feel less alone in the world, something that, that makes us um, feel a l maybe just a little bit more competent to face the dilemmas that we all face in, 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 in our lives. And then maybe we have achieved literature. Now, how does that differ from, from fiction? I would say only in the sense that um, we, we all know that there, are, that there are wonderful books out there that don't have in their mission anything other than to entertain, right? They're, they're, not, they're not trying to instruct. Their, their, their purpose, I suppose, for, for all of us, um, who we all have, diff we all have difficult lives, um, and the purpose of the kind of book that has no particular interest in instructing, but, but really wants to entertain us, I think is, is, is wonderful and perfectly valid and what it says is that we all need a break from 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 our lives from time from time to time and to go back to my mom for an instant for for a minute the books that she was reading she was she was reading very very good books um, but they were written by writers who I think she would have felt understood just how difficult her life was and would have wanted to provide her um, with an escape from the difficulties of, of her life. And they were very good writers. Um, 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 I mean, she loved mysteries, so of course she was reading, uh, she, read, she read Agatha Christie front to back, but then she also wrote, she also read writers 
um, who are writing in that genre, who are probably up to a little bit more than that, like Josephine Tay. Um, but she, but the, but the purpose for people who, who live hard lives very often is that good books, very, very good books, allow them um, to make their lives a little bit less troublesome on a daily basis. Um, at Bravo, um, Bravo for them. Um, it's not literature. So what? Fine, good. Um, and um, and 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 the more you read, every now and then, and she would every now and then she would she would st she would step out of that category of books that she felt most comfortable in. And uh, but um, yeah, I think that's that's. Did I answer the question at all? Okay, okay. <laughs> Did, did we get the microphone back? Oh, okay, yeah. But some of the, there's a, I see a couple of. Is it true you sat at Cristado's to do your, to write a novel? Is it true I what? That you sat at Cristado's? Oh God, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, and I met, somebody on the, I met somebody on the way into the auditorium tonight who said that I could be counted upon um, to, um, Cristados was one place. In the afternoons, very often I would go into Murphy's Tavern, as I was reminded today, where I would order a roast beef sandwich and a, and a, um, uh, and, and a beer and with my yellow legal pad where I was making notes probably on what I wrote that morning. Uh, and I wrote for years and years and years at Denny's um, here, here in Carbondale. And when we moved, um, when we moved to Maine, when we left, um, I took a job. My next job after this one at, uh, at SIU was at Colby College in Maine. It was a long journey. We had we had my mom with us at the time in the car. It was Barbara and and, my, and our and our daughters driving driving across country. And my mom wasn't in great health at the time, so we had to make a lot of stops. It was you know from from here to it shouldn't have taken five days, but I'm pretty sure it did. Um, <laughs> Or four, or four at least, and one of the one of the things that one of the things that happened on that long journey was that um, um, every time we passed the Denny's, I got an idea for a story, <laughs> <laughs> and it took it took me the longest. I, I the, one, one of the first things I did when we got to to Waterville, Maine, was find the find the nearest Denny's because by then I was conditioned. <laughs> There's another. Um, in the in the back, there's a someone yeah. in the, got a hand up in the back there. Um, so I recall reading that when you first went to the University of Arizona, or at least you first started in the MFA program there, you were writing novels like set in the desert, like set in the American Southwest. Um, and I forget where I read this, but I think that you had given. Um, like a story or a novel to an editor, agent, and, the, and this person said, oh, you know, I don't know about this, but this flashback to yeah. this place in yeah. upstate New York, <laughs> yeah. and, and, that, and that flashback is what became Mohawk, right? That's right. And I'm That's so right. curious to hear, like, yes, kind of like about the, the genesis of Mohawk in that book, but also about, like, this this novel or novels set in, in um, Arizona, you know, because, like, I don't know, it's kind of like thinking about our like juvenilia as writers, you know, and like what we started writing and then where we get to. It's like always yeah. kind of funny to reminisce. Yeah. Um, when, I, when I wanted to be a novelist without first knowing who I was, but I, I wanted to write really badly and I was writing really badly. Uh, <laughs> but but, but um, the kind of, if, it, if you'd asked me then when I first decided that I wanted to be a novelist, who, who would have, who, what kind of writer would I have wanted to be? I really wanted to write tough guy detective fiction. So if, if I could have, I'm the, I was reading Ross MacDonald at the time, but I also, you know, I was reading, I mean, the great noir writers. I was reading Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler um, and, and all of them, and James M. Cain. If somebody had asked me what kind of writer I wanted to be, I would have, I would have told them I want to write books set in California, preferably L.A., I wanted them to be very violent. I wanted them to be about cops, and I wanted to, and I wanted and I wanted to have a lot of steamy sex. I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to have I wanted to have great dames, with a, dames with a capital D, um, 
And the problem, and the only problem really with becoming that kind of writer was that I didn't know anything about dames and I didn't know anything about crime and I didn't know anything about cops and I'd, and I'd never lived in California. <laughs> Other than that, I was very well suited to, to become that kind of writer. But, but I, I, did, I did finally figure out that you couldn't, that, or at least I couldn't be that kind of writer. I couldn't pretend to have lived experience that I, that, that I not only didn't have, that I didn't even have anything adjacent to the kind of lived experience that I would have needed to write that kind of book. But I did because, because I was still living in Arizona at the time. I did write a book that was set in Tucson because that's where I was living. I could look out my, my living room window and see it. Um, and I wrote a book, the vast majority of I wrote I wrote the entire thing right to the end. And I gave it to the guy that I mentioned to you um, earlier, Bob Downs. Um, and, um, and he, God love him, he read, he read, he read the whole thing, um, and, um, um, and, and he said that it, uh, he, he said that, that the, that the book simply didn't have a pulse, uh, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't really, it didn't, it didn't really live, and it wasn't really convincing, my, the Tucson that I was writing about, despite the fact that I was describing it out my, 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 uh, my, my living room window. I was, I was, I was seeing it, but I hadn't lived there long enough. I don't think to to really to know what it was about, and that was coming through. And then he said, "The only part of this book that has a pulse, the only part of it that rings true, the only part of it that I can that I can see you in," was this one short flashback that took, that took place in an industrial town in upstate New York. And I could have, number one, cried, and, if I would, and, and number two, if I'd had a gun, I'd have probably shot him, because it was the one thing that I didn't want to hear. More than anything else, I did, I did not want to hear that, um, that that's who I was, and that's what I was going to spend the rest of my life working. Uh, um, the, the stories that I was going to be telling for the rest of my life because that was not who I wanted to be and that was not the kind of book I wanted to write. And I went home. I, I think I just, I just, after that, and of course, because I knew it was true, that was the other reason I hated him, because I knew it was true, and that was, I think that was, that was when I went home and, and gave in to, uh, to become the, the, the writer for better or worse that you see before you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to... Now, we've had, had a, saw a couple hands earlier over in this. Um, thank you for being here. It's very exciting for all of us in Carbondale. Um, could you discuss if your writing journey differed working on elsewhere? Yeah, the question, the question has to do with my, my memoir, Elsewhere. Um, and this one's gonna be, this one's gonna be difficult. Um, the writing of Elsewhere uh, probably caused uh, more pain um, than, than, than any of my books. Um, my mom, God love her, had a, had a very difficult life um, and it needn't have been that difficult. Um, she suffered from uh, obsessive compulsive disorder which is very treatable, but it has to be diagnosed, and she was she was never diagnosed. Um, and as and as a result of that, her life got more and more difficult. It got more and more narrow. Um, um, and um, I um, I never would have, I never could have um, written that written that memoir while she was alive, um, because it betrayed. Um, it betrayed the secret that she had kept over a lifetime. Uh, as mental illnesses go, one of the one of the more fascinating and and kind of in a way horrifying things about uh, obsessive compulsive disorder is that most crazy people, most people who are mentally ill, don't know that they are. Obsessive compulsives, on the other hand, know perfectly well that something is wrong with them. Uh, they just don't know what to do about it, and they spend 
unless they're diagnosed, unless they get treatment, they will, as my mother did, spend, you will spend an entire life trying to conceal what you know because you don't want anybody but you to know it. And, that's, and that was the sad story um, of my mother's life, also of my grandmother's life, of the female side of, 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 of my family going, going way, way back. They all suffered from this. It was not diagnosable that far back, but by the time, but by the time uh, 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 my mom lived her life, had she seen the right person that was eminently treatable. Um, but I couldn't write that book until until she um, until she passed, and and even then, it felt like um, I had that, like you know I had betrayed her by. By, it was a, it was a true story, but the truth was was a terrible truth, and it's the only book of mine that I did not tour with in hardcover, because what I imagined happening was um, someone confronting me in an audience like this and saying what I myself thought to be true, which was that I had been a terrible terrible son, to not to keep my not to keep my mom's secret. It was only I did. I did go out with the paperback because um, by then people were coming up to me and saying, um, my mother, my husband, my wife, my child um, suffers from this. And this and this has been this has been such I'm a caregiver or it's me or whatever. And I realized that the book was doing what I had hoped it would do, but had no, had absolutely no faith at all that it would do, was to provide um, a springboard for conversation about mental illness in general, but about obsessive compulsive disorder in particular, because it is so eminently treatable. Um, and 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 since then, I've had people um, come up to me and tell me that it's their favorite book of mine, and they're usually they're usually people who have suffered in some way or, or, or were dealing with, with someone who has suffered um, in some way that need not have suffered. Um, and so, you know, reluctantly, decades after writing that book, I've, I've, kindly, I've finally made a, kind of, made a kind of peace with it. Um, and, and the funny thing was that, that I, I wrote, when I wrote that book, I interrupted, I can't remember. Barbara, do you remember what novel I was writing? It was something I was having an absolute blast with. Well, it might have been Empire Falls, or it might have been that old Cape Magic. It might have been, it might have been that old, well, anyway, I interrupted, I interrupted a book that I was having an absolute blast writing. It was one of the most fun, I was just having the time of my life and I interrupted writing that book just because I had this horrific sense that there was something left undone. Um, and the end, of, and just to conclude this, the, the 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 book that I ended up writing, I thought I was writing a book about um, my relationship with my mother, in which I was going to be able to explain to people why things were always so difficult between us. And I thought that the reason for that was that we were so different. Only to discover in writing the book that, that what I was explaining to people was that the reason we were, had such a hard time getting along <laughs> through all those years was, what, was that we were so similar. Um, it was that I was, I was taking the the problem that she had and that and that that I have struggled with from time to time um, and 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 somehow just got lucky by becoming a writer i could I could take um, her her the very kinds of compulsions and um, things that things that the things that she had to do when she was feeling um, obsessive compulsive the need to touch something the need to, to organize everything to make everything just so. Um, I had turned that incredible liability 
into something that I call revision. <laughs> 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 to, take, to take something, it's the same principle, basically. Obsessing over something until, until you've got it just as perfect as you can possibly make it. And for me, it made, it, it, it made, it made my, my life the very thing that was so problematic uh, for my mother who made so many sacrifices um, for me and, and, um, and bedeviled her. And so many people in that, on, that, on that side of my family was something that through pure dumb luck brought me to, brought me to um, a life, a living, an occupation where something like that could actually be turned into a plus. You know, it, and it baffles me to this day how that happened, why it happened, um, but it did. So, yeah. Yeah. No, we could we could use a lighter note now. Thank you. I, 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 What's with the goose? The goose. The What's goose with that reappears Lucky Hank. Uh, oh, with uh, yeah. Straight man. And oh, so somebody's been watching Lucky Hank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and um, Lucky Lucky Hank was, um, I think, a difficult project um, for for everyone involved in it um, because the book is thirty years old. Um, and the world that I was writing about in some ways is still the same. I mean, we've been swapping academic horror stories all day uh, uh, here. Um, the, 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 the fact that um, the academic world in some ways has remained the same, in other ways it's changed, it's changed dramatically, um, and, and you see a lot of those ways in, in the way these very talented writers, these are the same writers who wrote... Um, um, two or three years of The Office, the the years that it won all those Emmys. These are really talented writers, but their job was to bring up to date a uh, a thirty year old novel to translate it into a into a world that, in some respects, just doesn't even exist anymore. For instance, they couldn't use the title Straight Man because Straight Man doesn't mean today what it meant <laughs> today. Today it means cisgendered male, which probably is not a, the best title for, for, <laughs> for, for, a lucky, for a lucky Hank. The world has changed so much, in fact, that Hank now, in this miniseries, cannot even threaten a digital goose. <laughs> In, in my novel, Hank goes up there, they're walking along the duck path and there are ducks and geese around and Hank grabs, Hank grabs a, a, a goose, uh, holds it up to the cameras because there's a, there's a, the cameras are there set up for um, um, some sort of interview on campus and he picks up this goose and, and threatens to kill a duck a day until his demands are met, right? And now in, in these poor writers in, in, in Straight Man, um, they can't do that anymore, so they've, so they've had, in one of the episodes, Hank has to box a goose. Now, you can imagine how difficult that was to get Hank into a situation where he's wearing boxing gloves, where there's also a goose nearby, <laughs> and, where, and where he can, where he can, well. And, and so what's, what's happened is because the, world, the academic world has, has, changed, has changed so much, um, and in some ways, not at all. And then, of course, they move. They and instead of filming it in some place like my Railton, Pennsylvania, which was Penn State Altoona, uh, in central Pennsylvania, then you take the whole thing off to Vancouver because it's easier to shoot there. And and sudden and suddenly you're looking at something that doesn't that bears no relationship at all um, to the novel. But given that, I think that they've done, and, and Bob Odenkirk, God love him, has, has taken, has taken my Hank. Yeah. Yeah. Those of you, those of you who have seen this, they've, they've taken, um, my Hank, who was, who was basically a pot stirrer, a, a grenade thrower. Um, his, his whole purpose in life is to mix things up, to stir things up, um, 
um, and he has an answer for, for everything. Um, and Bob has taken that character, I think, in a much more um, serious direction. And, um, and his, his Hank, I find absolutely fascinating. And my Hank was not going to work in that, um, in that adaptation. Or at least I don't think it, I don't think it could have. But he found in my Hank something that I found absolutely riveting to watch. And um, I'm, I'm hoping there's going to be a season two, mostly because I, mostly because I want to see what he's going to do um, in, in, in season two with that character who we left, he and his, and his wife, Lily, who is a much more fully um, vested and more round um, character than, than, than my Lily in, in Straight Man, those two characters at the end of the first season have everything on the line. And so I really, I really do hope, I don't think we're gonna know until the actor strike is, is over whether there's gonna be a second season or not. But I hope there is because those two characters have me riveted and I, I really wanna see what direction Bob is gonna take Hank in the second season. Maybe final question? Or just a couple more? Nineteen sixty-nine. So where was I? Nineteen. Where is Dundee High School? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so why was I why was I there? You were teaching my English class and you rescued the Isaac from Heaven on the Cross and you were using English class as an honors student. Okay. So I was a so I was a visiting writer? One of us is hallucinating. <laughs> <laughs> really? I never, well, all I can say is, if I was ever a high school teacher anywhere in Chicago or nearby Chicago in Dundee, then I have wiped that from my memory just as clean, <laughs> just as clean as a whistle. <laughs> okay, I honestly, I, I don't, I, I, I could, I could have, I could have said, okay, because I, I do travel a lot and I do teach and I and I visit high school classes. But the idea of my ever having been a, a full time teacher there is one I'm I'm going to have to wrap my mind around. <laughs> How about it? Uh, uh, <laughs> final well, question, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Some something highfalutin yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, in terms of, so my, I was in corporate forever. I was seen getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning writing, you know, dumb and those crazy novels that I can't, not that I can't. Yeah. Now I don't do that. I just work. I write six, seven days a week. Mm hmm. My hustle is uh, editing other people's novels. Mm hmm. Yeah. My novels are 80 to 100 plus drafts. Mm -hmm. The writers that I talk to, they, and I know they're younger, and I write literary fiction, historical fiction. Right. A lot of these people are grown men, fantasy. Yeah. You know, yeah. And they write three to four drafts in that case. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What that to me is is sad. It's the term. Mm -hmm. Because it tells me and I'm not arguing against fantasy or you know, none of that. It's depressing because 
I, it feels to me that literary fiction is not going the way that I was hoping it would go. So I have a faith back there. You guys have to hear it. I'll, I'll try to, re when we get to the end of the question here, I'll, I'll try to, yeah, okay. So, I guess my, my thing is, is what is your take on what's, what's the, the, the projection of literature these days in terms of genre lit literature and literary fiction? Because I'm, I love literary fiction. Right. I have nothing against any of the other genres. Right. But from everything that I'm seeing interacting with these people that I'm dealing with, editing novels and stuff like that, is they have zero interest in that. Right, right. Well, and I and I, I think what we're what we're talking about here, um, here too, we're talking about the divide between the kind of fiction, whether it's romance or 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 or, or um, whatever, uh, in in the genres, that there is there's there's a, a sad dearth of editing lots of times and a sad dearth of just seriousness um, that we see, and I and I think that that's been aided and abetted by things that we don't have any control over at all. I think the fact that that books can be self-published now so easily, the fact that that um, um, uh, gee, I don't, I, I, I mean, people read for people read for different reasons, but um, my my sense is that that there always was and there still is um, um, room for 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 both kinds of writers, the kind of, you're obviously a very obsessive writer. If you're writing 80 drafts of something, then you're, then you're a very obsessive writer and you're not gonna, and you're, and you're not gonna, you know, do three drafts and, and out and say, okay, here, good enough. And, and even if someone came along and published it, you, you wouldn't be happy with it. So you're gonna do, you're gonna do things your way. And other, and other people are just gonna say, you know what, if it's, if it's, if it's good enough and I get paid, then, then as, as, as if readers like it and, and it's good enough for me and I get paid, then it's like an awful lot of other jobs. It's not that different from other jobs where people can be divided along the same lines where they have nothing to do with the arts. There are certain people who, there are certain people who, um, um, you know, I think of, again, going back to my, those days when I was working road construction with, with my old man, there were, and my, my, my grandfather who was a glove cutter, there are, there are people who work with their hands who are, my grandfather was one of them, who are absolutely obsessive about, about making things exactly right and they're willing to spend the time and they have exactly no use for shoddy work even when the shoddy work, the person who's doing the shoddy work gets paid exactly the same amount of money that, that he gets paid or maybe more because you can do more of those things if you're willing to do the shoddy work. You can do more of those things and turn out more product and get paid more so that the person who's trying to figure out the best way to do that and is, and is, and is obsessing over it. But I mean, that exists in all trades. It's not just the arts. And um, um, there's, there's always a market for shoddy, shitty work. <laughs> Rick, uh, final question. <laughs> Just a quick final question. I know uh, we have students in the audience and, and you're in the classes. I mean, everyone was saying, you know, what's the secret? And I, I came across uh, a couple of sentences. Actually, it was the, the graduation speech. I think yeah. the one commencement. Yeah. And, and one of the words of advice you gave to the graduates is search for the kind of work you would gladly do for free and get somebody to pay you for it. No, and yeah. say, don't expect this to happen overnight. It took me nearly 20 years to get people to pay me a living rage for my white writing, which makes me, even at this juncture, one of the fortunate few. Yeah, and that's, that's, the, that's the thing to know about. And, and it's very important to say now, I think, um, yeah, in just terms of wrapping this up here, when I talk to students now, um, I, 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 never, I never want to discourage any student for whom this is an absolute must. Because, and I don't want to make, get all religious about this and say that it's, it's like a call to the priesthood or anything like that. But, but if it's something that you must do, then, then you must do it. But I would also say that these times are fraught in ways that they weren't fraught when I was, when I was coming up because if you are a writer now and you feel and you feel this urgent need to do this, um, 
one of the difficulties now is that it's as difficult now as it's ever been to do that kind of work and do it well. But the other thing you have to, you say, don't expect this to happen soon. That's still true, and it's probably even truer now than before. But the other thing that I didn't have to worry about um, that writers, young writers now have to worry about, that if you're going to do something like an MFA program, um, and you're going to spend the time it takes to apprentice to, to a trade, to a vocation that's going to take you a long time. It's going to take you longer to do this and do it well than it takes to become a doctor or a lawyer. But, again, if you're lucky and if you get there now, you, whereas I would, this wouldn't have happened to me uh, or to my generation of writers, now you are also likely to be saddled with crushing debt. Right, because these, the, in order to spend that kind of time and work with and work with good people in something like an MFA program or its its substitute, you are going to be building up the kind of debt that is going to be very difficult to erase in any field in the arts, because the vast majority of artists are poor, and you know, I am. As, I've, I, I, as I think I've said a hundred times today probably, I am one of the fortunate few that have, that have been able to have the kind of career that I wanted to have and, and do it the way that I wanted to do it. Um, I, have, I have never chased money. I have, it's, that's, that's never been part of the equation, but I have been paid very well, very well, very well indeed. That's not the reason I do it, but the money has followed me in a way that it follows very, very few artists. So if you're an artist, not just a writer, but if you're an artist of, of any sort, it's, it's, it's very difficult and it's more difficult now because of how long it takes and the kind of debt that you're likely to rack up. And it's just, you, you really do have to think long and hard ab about what you're going to do to pay the bills um, and and um, to make sure that those when those student loans come due, you're able to start paying. I paid off all of my student loans, all of them. The, the government had been following me from university to university while I was trying to cover my tracks. <laughs> but I but I paid off all of my student loans with the advance from my first novel, Mohawk, for which I got $8,500. Now, I know that inflation, that would make it more now, given all these years later, but that's not possible anymore for a young person who wants to be an artist, I think, to, um, um, to after the kind, of, the kind of debt that you're going to be accumulating now, you're not going to pay that off with the advance. And believe me, it wasn't the entire advance. It was like $6,000 of an $8,500 advance. I used 6,000 of that. I thought my agent was going to break right down and cry mm -hmm. when, he, when he learned that I was using that money to pay off my student loans. But, it's, but, for, students, but for students in the arts, across the arts, it's, it's, there, are much more, there are many more things to think about today. It's, it's tough, it's tough. Um, but if you must, you must. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>